I have a rule about being constructive, so I can't ask any questions right now because all of the questions that I have right now are rhetorical and they end with the word idiot. Do you know what a rhetorical? No, of course you know what that is. You're an idiot. The Wrestling Life. A long December and there's reason to believe Maybe this year hey everybody, it's the Wrestling Life episode 285. It is the first week of December of 2021. Yeah, I'm Ethan. And I'm Liam. Liam, we have so much to talk about this week. And as always, so many, many things we can't talk about right here on the first and the only wrestling podcast. So we had the uh, the Evergreen show last week. We weren't here to talk about the very top goal and exciting Survivor Series news. The show where they opened with the main event. <laughs> and did a bunch of stuff in between. And then ended with uh, Roman Reigns and Big E uh, squeezing each other for 15 minutes. Before having <laughs> having like five minutes of a fun match. As you pretty much expected. Mm-hmm. Uh, so now... WWE does not have a pay-per-view in December, and they usually don't even try in December anyway. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so now they're really not trying. They have day one on New Year's Day, so they there's there's that. Maybe they're they're building some things for that. Uh, Edge came back this week. Um, they're they're laying groundwork, and they're doing I guess the three way with. Kevin Owens and Seth Rollins and Big E uh, for the WWE title at that show. They're doing. It looks like they're going to do Edge and The Miz, which is not something I would do, <laughs> but it's something that they're doing anyway. So the next month or so of WWE is being uh, is being laid out here, and uh, they're trying less than usual in a period of the year where they typically don't try at all. Uh, just general thoughts. What are you feeling about the WWE coming out of Survivor Series and heading into uh, day one? Yeah, I didn't. I haven't thought the shows have been bad, which, as we often say on the show, is almost a disappointment because maybe we'd have more to talk about on our show if they were like really, really bad shows. Um, but they're like they're it's it just feels like a lot of spinning wheels, a lot of a lot of killing time. Yeah, they're they're doing this. Uh, you know, Kevin Owens and Rollins and, and Big E kind of three person angle, um, which I assume is designed because they want Big E and Rollins to go at least through the rumble. So you can have Big E pin someone that's not Seth Rollins at uh, at the day one show um, and then and, go. And Kevin Owens contract expires like February 1st or whatever. So, right. Yeah. So you would. <laughs> So you, I mean, I, I'm surprised they're not, they're not treating him like they were, they, st- they don't think there's a chance he would resign in that he's still like in a top guy feud, but he is gonna, I think he's gonna lose to probably both Rollins and Big E on his way to this match and then lose in the match and then probably do a few more jobs on television on his way out as well. But sure. Yeah, I mean, there's again, there's nothing wrong with that. They're they're doing they're building to some, I guess, sort of marquee matches on television. They're doing, if you can call it that, they're doing Liv Morgan versus Becky on TV, which maybe they'll just do a DQ and then rematch at the day one show, or maybe they're just going to blow it off here. Hard to tell. Um, but yeah, I guess the most interesting thing on WWE television this week was the two separate segments where they were referencing people that had been fired this year. Um, and particularly in the Becky Lynch live Morgan segment where uh, I guess the storyline reason that WWE <laughs> has cut 105 wrestlers this year or whatever is that Becky Lynch and big stars like her are taking too much money from this poor mom and pops company <laughs> And so they just can't afford to pay those undercard guys like like Ruby Riot or John Morrison. Yeah, that was quite something. Uh, first of all, it's absolutely not true. Like she did to get a new contract, mm-hmm. but I mean, just the profit margins of this company are absurd. Obscene. <laughs> They're absolutely absurd. They're getting hundreds of million dollars a year from. Fox and hundreds of million do- millions of dollars a year from NBC Universal <laughs> for for their content. 
and it's like, oh, we couldn't possibly put together a show uh, for any less than we already. Anyway, yeah, very strange. And to your point, not only did uh, Liv Morgan bring it up uh, in her Becky Lynch segment where she blamed Becky having a big contract for people being fired, uh, Edge brought it up in his promo segment with The Miz. And in both cases, the baby faces were trying to put heat <laughs> on the heels for um, for people being fired. And it's like, but at the end of the day, we know that the promotion fired people. And so you trying having your baby faces try to stand up for the company cutting people is very stupid. Yeah, I mean, and I know like back in the day, Punk mentioned it in one of his promos. I don't think that was too much better, but at least he was yelling at Triple H yes. <laughs> and Vince McMahon when he brought them up. He wasn't yelling at, he didn't accuse John Cena of getting Chris Masters fired or whatever. Right. Um, so there's a little bit of difference there. But yeah, and it is that thing. And we talk about this a lot or have talked about it a lot over the years. It's the same with like, you know, do in, in a different way. It's the same as doing a lame DQ finish to after a 20 minute match, or it's like having a heel authority figure on the show where it's like, that's, and they, and they blame all of the problems on that. Like they did when ratings were down a couple of years ago and they blamed it all on Baron Corbin. Like, <laughs> it's like, people know that that's not why. Like, and so when you bring it up or you point to it, they don't get mad at Becky Lynch, the wrestling character, or Miz, the wrestling character. You're just reminding people that the company that they're watching, or in the case of the live audiences, paid money to see here, just fired a hundred people. Like it's it's very counterproductive, and you know, not something I would do. And to your point, it wasn't even really. I guess the idea is, it's as you said, the baby face putting heat on the heel. <laughs> Which it's like, well, maybe the heel could just try to get. I mean, to be fair, Becky's Becky's trying her very best to get booed, but like nobody wants to boo her. We've talked about that before, and it's right. the Miz. Like, how much are you going to get the Miz booed? Like, right. how much does your average viewer, even if it were true, how much would your average viewer care that John Morrison was fired because Miz went on Dancing with the Stars? Like. Right. So I, I question like there doesn't seem to be even if you were doing the, the mythical, I'll oh, think of all the heat this is going to get, you know, not again. The other example that sticks in my mind is when they had um, Moxley mentioned Roman's cancer on, on that. Like nobody was mad at Dean Ambrose, the heel wrestler. Right. Like they were mad at they're mad at the company that scripted the line. So I don't I don't see how that's productive and how it would accomplish anything other than just bumming everybody out and probably including the people that had to say the lines, if I had to guess. Yeah, there is that weird thing, though, where I've talked about this maybe once on the show and probably 400 times privately off the air, but there <laughs> is that weird edge uh uh, Lita, CM Punk, Beth Phoenix, uh, square rectangle, uh, <laughs> love love rectangle that uh, I like to think about about once every six months. <laughs> Just think about how weird it is. And CM Punk brought up the Miz in his promo. So then Edge on, on Dynamite last week. So then Edge on Raw this week wanted to. <sighs> He name checked without name checking. He mentioned that someone on another show brought up the Miz to try to get a pop. Anyway, so Miz Edge wanted to do his version of the CM Punk MJF promo battle that he saw on Dynamite on Raw with him and the Miz. And God bless Edge. It's just not quite the talker that CM Punk is. Yeah, I, I I didn't really think of it. I guess it's kind of obvious, right? Like <laughs> now that now that you said it, I hadn't necessarily thought about it in that context that that they were like, we're gonna do. Oh, you thought that punk right. MJF promo was good. Now look, check out what we do. We've got right. the real Miz. 
Right. Um, <laughs> I mean, having Maurice out there was, you know, an admitted bonus. Um, <laughs> but overall, uh, yeah, it's it was it wasn't a terrible promo or anything. Like it was no, fine. It was fine. But there's yeah. also the thing which I have talked about, I think, recently on the show, and we have probably talked about off and on the air before, which is that at the end of this, we have to be the idea is we're going to be excited to watch the Miz wrestle Edge, right? Which I cannot really envision a world where I'm excited to watch those two guys wrestle, um, especially just because it's like we don't know how much longer Edge is going to wrestle. Obviously, he had a lot of time taken away from him. So even if he wrestles for, you know, 10 more years sparingly like do we really do we want to use up that time with a Miz feud like apparently apparently the answer is yes so it wouldn't be my answer but I'm sure he had a say in it yeah and again maybe that is part of it maybe it's just like I'll do I'll do Punk's feud better than that again maybe not that's the sole motivation but maybe that was a, that was certainly the framing i think of the promo now that now that you've laid that out to me but. A, a f- thousand percent it was um yeah so uh by the way beth phoenix leading nxt uh, Aunt betty yeah god bless her i do think she improved like i know it was it was kind of hip to crap on her but i think if we did not learn from like renee being on commentary being on commentary in that company is not an easy task <laughs> especially yeah. the amount of jargon that she has that they have to throw out and the nicknames and all that stuff. Yes. Like it's not a natural way of speaking, even if you are a naturally gifted speaker. Yes. Um, so I thought she improved. I thought she did her best to elevate stuff that she was involved in. And also for a lot of that time, she's working with like Maro and Nigel and then, and then later on uh, Wade Barrett and, Who's the who's the guy on NXT now? Lonnie Donegan. <laughs> yes, Lonnie Donegan who's married, going to marry Mackenzie Mitchell. Yeah. Oh yes, that's right. So uh, Vic Vic Joseph. That's right. So you know, I think she's done. She did as good a job, and I can imagine anyone, especially after like have, being asked to come to Orlando and do it during COVID and stuff like that's. I can understand why after a couple of years of that, you would maybe be you would maybe not want to do that full time anymore. She did do it from home for, for a while. Mm -hmm. Like they had her, Nigel and Morrow in three separate locations calling that show during the pandemic. And you would not have known, like, I don't think they were going live at the time, but you would not have known they were in three separate locations because remember they had the, the fake people sitting at the desk. Right. (laughs) I forgot. <laughs> that was awesome. Yeah, they had seat they had seat fillers sitting at the desk pretending to be. I don't know. That was really bizarre. Part but, of that, uh, I think, the reason you didn't notice is because when Morrow, I feel like Morrow, when he's on lead commentary yeah. with two other people, it kind of sounds like they're they're talking independently <laughs> of each other often. Yes, yes, like, that's true. Like Morrow's doing his his insane wild. Uh, uh, metaphors and everything and then the other the other commentators are kind of throwing out their nonsense you know their bits and, and trying to get in catchphrases and stuff so it's yeah there was that uh the, that nxt commentary team was always i think a, felt a little bit like people were just talking and unaware <laughs> of what the other person was saying <laughs> yes i watch the show every week now and it still feels that way, even with <laughs> even with Vic Joseph and Wade Barrett there with Beth. Um, but I think Beth, I think Beth's just a really cool person and I wish her the best. And whatever she does, she will succeed at because everything she's ever done, she succeeded at. So good for her. She just released a song not too long ago, right? She put out a, a I think it was an EP, which is like yeah. uh, four or five songs or whatever. But yeah, I haven't, I haven't listened to it, but I I had to write about it. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Good. So good for, I think that's an interesting sign that we were supposed to be talking about raw. And instead we talked about edge's wife for five minutes. That's <laughs> that is, I, it, it was a more interesting topic, quite frankly. So I don't, uh, I don't regret yeah. that at all. <laughs> yeah. So then I know we have to, we have to, we have to touch on SmackDown real quick. So if you remember in the uh, the title swap segment between uh, Charlotte Flair and Becky Lynch on SmackDown, they uh, the, that's all, all anyone remembers from that segment is Becky Lynch and Charlotte Flair getting into a real argument. Uh, 
Mm -hmm. But at the end of that segment, Sasha Banks came out and was supposed to be positioned as the top baby face on SmackDown Mm -hmm. and attacked Charlotte Flair. Uh, So then after like a week, they realized, hey, we probably are going to have to save Charlotte and Sasha for WrestleMania because we don't have anybody ready (laughs) because Mm -hmm. because we fired everybody. (laughs) So that's probably the WrestleMania match. So we got to give Charlotte some filler feuds between now and uh, first week of April or whatever, last week of March, whatever it is. And so they so all of a sudden Tony Storm just like announces, I'm going to I'm going to fight you, Charlotte Flair. <laughs> and then uh, and then uh, here's what they did this week. They uh, they took Tony Storm and they had Charlotte throw pies at her. Yeah. She just stood there. She didn't get a microphone and angrily swear revenge. She didn't go after Charlotte for throwing pies at her. She just let her throw pies at her. Yeah, she got she got hit with the first pie. Charlotte laughed at her face and walked away, turned around, walked back to her, grabbed a second pie and hit her with that pie tail. So you're left with the visual of Tony Storm covered in pie. Mm hmm. White, creamy substance. No subtext. Tell you what. I've heard. I think I said on this show. I bet. I've, I've been watching Vince McMahon and Bruce Pritchard produce television. Practically my entire life at this point. Mm-hmm. I'm sure that even though Tony Storm is a license to print money. I'm sure that they think she's overweight Mm. and i heard someone say they think she's overweight (laughs) and so even though she has like hired a personal trainer and has gotten into much better shape and lost some weight over the last few months they still managed to do a segment this uh, this past week on television where they covered her in pie. I don't think I don't believe in coincidences and I really don't believe in WWE coincidences because it's really not that hard to see through WWE coincidences. Mm-hmm. So anyway, they covered Tony Storm in pie. And even though she's a license to print money, uh, yeah, good luck with that. Yeah, I think even if you know, without, as I said, if you just watch the television product, like she went through a gear change and then went back to her old gear recently. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like there's, there's some, she was on TV for a while and then suddenly disappeared from television after they brought her up and then reappeared, as you mentioned, when they realized they had no one else. Right. Um, And then they threw pies at her. Um, Yeah. So. Correct. Yeah, I think even if even if you uh, weren't, uh, you know, if you, even if you're if you're not a, a wrestling insider, you could probably <laughs> look at the the subtext on this on this television show and figure out, OK, there's something about her cosmetically that they have decided they do not like. And they've decided to uh, address that publicly on their yes. on their yes. worldwide television show. Yes. Um, so that's. That sucks for her, you know. Um, yep. Yeah i uh, i feel I feel pretty bad for her, but I don't I don't know. Like i I think that's uh, that's going to probably keep happening in various ways, and then she will lose to Charlotte, and then you know, and get a text <laughs> on the next earnings call after the next earnings call. I don't know. Like, there's like a pattern to this sort of thing now that is it's horrible. And I hope I'm wrong and I hope she's super successful in main events, WrestleMania next year. But if we're, if we're looking at patterns of history, especially recent history, even uh, with this company uh, doesn't look great. It doesn't, it doesn't. And like, I know uh, Dave Meltzer always says that his litmus test for like how the point he knew WWE could screw up anyone was with Ricochet when, when Ricochet mm-hmm. did not become a giant star there for me with WWE, it's her. <laughs> it's like, okay, yep. They could, 
they could find something wrong with anyone and not <laughs> make it work with anyone. There's Just, a, yeah. Just a there's, license to print money. There's a line from um, maybe my favorite television show community, which is if you were starving on a, ju- on a desert island, uh, you would judge every ship that, ca- that came by to save you. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's kind of how it feels. If Vince McMahon and Bruce Pritchard were uh, were starving on a desert island, they would tell every female ship captain that sailed by that they needed to lose ten pounds. It's, it's really, really bad. It's really, really, really bad. I think she got heat for uh, announcing that she was going to marry Juice Robinson too. Oh no, that's that's forbidden. Right. <laughs> He's a guy they fired. No, he's the guy who asked for his release mm-hmm. like six years ago, almost seven years ago, and they granted it, but they don't like him. Because <laughs> he asked to leave. They wanted him to stay on and then I guess. quietly get fired. I guess. I don't know, man. Anyway, so yeah, they uh, SmackDown's real weird. <laughs> they had Sam <laughs> Zayn win a battle royal and then also announced Brock's coming back. So, you know. Right. Right. And the way they announced Brock was coming back, it was like, um, well, that, that renders Sammy's thing null and void. It's like, well, why? Why? The Sammy won a battle royal to get a title shot at Roman Reigns. Mm-hmm. And then they announced Brock Lesnar's coming back. And Sammy was freaking out like, well, what does this mean for me? It's like, well, it shouldn't mean anything for you. <laughs> <laughs> what is that? Who cares? You wouldn't think so. But, you know. It's not like they were like, well, Brock would be the number one contender, but since he's suspended, we are having this match. And then, like, if they had said that maybe before the match started, and then and then the announced the suspension is lifted, you could at least say that, and then you can do Sammy and Roman on TV or something eventually. Yeah, but they they didn't do any of that. No, they, they didn't. Yeah, so just because they always push Brock as the number one contender or the champion when he's around, we're supposed to just assume that that means it's uh, it's all over for Sammy. I guess so. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah, yeah. NXT has a War Games show this coming weekend. There's a men's War Games match that is like uh, the Millionaire's Club against the New Blood. <laughs> so, I'm not sure there are any literal millionaires in the Millionaire's Club, but it's the old guys versus the young guys, and they gave the young guys the uh, man advantage. <laughs> and much like the uh, the New Blood versus the Millionaires Club, the old guys holding on to their spots are the good guys. Yeah, yeah, that's kind of where I was going with that, and that's <laughs> it's it's a choice. It's a choice for sure. I watch that show every week now, and I'm not sure who I'm supposed to root for in. Um, yeah, in, in in that feud, all all of the all of the old guys, um, let's see, uh, Tommaso Ciampa, babyface, Johnny Gargano has been a heel forever, but um, kind of a comedy baby fa- com- comedy heel, which kind of gets you babyface stuff. Anyway, he's being presented as babyface in this feud, Pete Dunn, badass babyface, L.A. Knight has been a heel, uh, but they're going against uh, Carmelo Hayes, heel, Grayson Waller. I'm not sure. Tony D'Angelo <laughs> heel. Uh, Tony D'Angelo, who like the most stereotypical. The only way they can make Tony D'Angelo more stereotypical characters is if they call him Tony Meatballs or something. <laughs> if he wore a red hat with an M on it and a pair of blue suspenders. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And uh, who's the other guy on the team? Oh, Braun Breaker, who's been presented as a badass baby face. But anyway, yeah, that match makes no sense. None of it makes any sense. Should be a fun match, though. Johnny Gargano gets his first, uh, maybe last War Games match. Yeah, um, that's that'll. I'm sure it'll be good. I'm sure it'll be a good match. It'll be interesting to see. They're doing it. Are they? They're still at the Performance Center for this show, right? Yeah, that's right. So it'll be interesting to see. War, I guess TNA probably did a, a War Games in front of less people, probably <laughs> at some point. But I'm sure they did. It's interesting to see a, a War Games in front of like 110 people. Yeah, yeah, it will be. Hey, so they book this show and then they realize, hey, John Gargano's contract expires three days before the show. <laughs> so 
So then they, <laughs> he signed a one week extension. But to me, the fact that he hasn't signed more than a one week extension and his contract is up like after the next TV. Uh, I think Jack Gargano is going to go somewhere else. Yeah, I think so. I think, I think he's out of there. I think if, I don't, if the idea is, well, you can't stay in NXT, like what is Johnny Gargano going to do on the, on, on the main roster? Be a referee? Like, yeah, yeah exactly. I know, they, I know he and O'Reilly had like a dark match at a SmackDown a month ago or whatever, but I mean, we, we heard, I mean, I don't think Adam Cole had a dark match, but you know, we heard the same thing of Cole meeting with, with Vince McMahon like a month before he left. And like, yeah, I think they, they kind of give him the once over and they're like, yeah, we don't, we don't want to lose you, but it's like, but then, you know, Adam Cole talked about like in the, in his conversation, he was like, well, maybe we'd like change your name or like mess with your look a little bit and then see what happens. Type of thing. It's like, well, if that's your pitch to keep a guy, I'd hate to see like what you say to it. I guess you just fire the guy if you don't want to, if you don't want to keep him. but sure. Yeah. I mean, I, I, for whatever, I know he, Johnny Gargano became like the, the poster boy for the, the NXT over dramatic, too long, too many near fall main events that I think people kind of tired of a little bit towards the end of the heyday of NXT and kind of the beginnings of AEW. But yeah, I think Johnny Gargano is one of the best, like pure baby faces in wrestling in like the last 20 years. Like I think he's tremendous. And obviously he's also showed his chops as being able to do like comedy character work and stuff. And yes, it's very silly, like, you know, WWF 1995 comedy, but like, I'm, I'm all right with that. So um, I I think he's very entertaining and like, yeah, he could go be an asset in a lot of different ways on a lot of other people's wrestling uh, television shows. Yep. Roderick Strong is defending the Cruiserweight Championship against Joe Gacy on that show in a heel versus heel match. (laughs) Again. The the psychology in most of these matches is pretty messed up. Um, Joe yeah. Gacy is also not 205 pounds, I'm pretty sure. Right. So he's doing uh, he's doing like a uh, uh, a woke gimmick as a heel. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right. Mm-hmm. He's talking about how cancel culture and uh, the the 205 pound weight limit for the cruiserweight. Uh, division is uh invokes weight shaming <laughs> so <laughs> and so like it's it's funny it, it's fu- it's funny it's funny i don't i don't i don't hate it like it it's that is it's, like the most modern wwe gimmick i can <laughs> i can imagine like i can't believe that's on wwe television just because it's actually like if you're critiquing that that generation of people Right. Or at least who you think that generation of people are, right? That's a pretty good like shout at a wrestling version of that character. Yeah, and the problem is that he's not particularly good at playing that character. Mm-hmm, <laughs> mm-hmm. But yeah, they're they're yeah, it's, it's okay, it's okay. Uh, Imperium against Kyle O'Reilly and Von Wagner for the NXT Tag Team Titles. O'Reilly's just trying to help get his tall friend with long hair over before i assume he's out the door also <laughs> so like they've been thrown together as, as a baby face team imperium they let them cut promos in their native tongue every week <laughs> fine whatever cameron grinds versus duke hudson duke hudson you know that's a hair versus hair match uh, cameron grimes is uh, is pretty fun as a goofy comedy ba- millionaire ri- millionaire hillbilly baby face duke hudson is like I don't know. First of all, it's like the worst name ever. And second of all, <laughs> it's he's um, he's just not very good, and they have him do a lot of acting. And it's like <laughs> he's it's nah, he's it's Duke, not. Duke Hudson's the poker guy, right? Yes, that's okay. correct. Yeah, all right. Uh, r- real name Brendan Vink, <laughs> right? Which I think yes. was the name he used on television when he was briefly on Raw, <laughs> teaming with Shane Thorne and being managed by MVP for about two weeks. Yeah, that sounds right. Uh, that's a pandemic thing. Yeah. Yeah. Duke Hudson, uh, not very good. Uh, Cameron Grimes, pretty good. And then there's a women's war games match on that show where you just pray that nobody on the heel team dies because it's uh, Raquel Gonzalez, Io Shirai, 
Raquel's good. EO is freaking fantastic. Cora Jade is good. And Kaylee Ray. Kaylee Ray's good versus Dakota Kai. Dakota's good. Uh, and Toxic Attraction. Toxic Attraction is Mandy Rose. Mandy's okay. Uh, Gigi Dolan is okay. And uh, JC Jane. I just hope no one gets hurt on the on that heel side. Like they did that ladder match and EO's partner like broke her leg or whatever. Yeah. Why can't I ever remember that girl's name? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I can't remember. Like Zoe Stark? I think so. I feel like Zoe yeah. is definitely the first name. Anyway. Yeah. But anyway, yeah, that's, yeah, yeah, hope everybody's okay. Also, um, I don't know what her contract status is, but like Io Shirai, what's uh how come she didn't get a dark match? Is it because we already have a Japanese woman on the main roster and we don't want to? Couldn't tell you. I couldn't just, tell you. Would, I'd be happy to hear another theory. It's literally what I'm saying because she I was, was in the conversation for like best female wrestler in the United States, and she has been in NXT for like four years. Dude, I would literally come on the show five years, four years ago, four years ago, and say Tony Storm should be main eventing Raw every week. Mm-hmm. And I don't know why you Shirai has been main eventing WWE shows with Tony with Tony Storm for like three of those four years. And it's it's mind boggling. Yeah. EO is so good. She's incredible. Yeah, it was uh I forget what it was. I think it was after one of the last firings. I was reminded that one of the NXT shows they did when they came to uh my t- my hometown of Bel Air, Maryland, uh uh, they taped it was actually for an NXT television show and EO wrestled on that show and I was like wow I got I just had a moment of like wow I got to see like a lot of really talented people come through NXT in that system and I was like wow and then I thought about it again I was like wow EO still still in NXT yep. only now NXT is way more sad because they don't get to have a badass arena show once every six weeks or whatever yeah there is that Let's touch on some AEW stuff here real quick before we get out of here. Uh, New Japan uh, wrote, well, we'll touch on New Japan first because there's only like three things to say about it. They're doing New Japan versus Noah for the third night of Wrestle Kingdom. Fine. <laughs> some <laughs> self-awareness in that they're like, we do not have enough people to make a third night of the show without doing rematches. I, I suppose... Uh, everybody was afraid of travel restrictions and foreigners not being able to get into the country. But the deal is, if you have a visa already, you can go to Japan. You still have to quarantine for two weeks, but you can still go to Japan. They're not issuing any new visas in Japan, though. So mm-hmm. if you don't have one, you are not going over there. So everybody was throwing their hands above their head and panicking. And I was not quite sure why, uh, but. Okay. Because people just looked at the headline. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, and uh, yeah, they are the two most boring tournaments of all time are happening. <laughs> the World Tag League and the uh, Best of the Super Juniors. Where Whichever, they... Whichever one of the Briscoes named the World Tag League is the most boringest <laughs> tournament in wrestling history or whatever. Really yes. nailed it. He did. He did that. Yeah. Uh, so that's New Japan stuff. AEW, they had a... Uh, they had a show this week. They have a show coming up in two weeks where uh, Hangman Page will defend the his newly won world title against Brian Danielson. And so that's it. Uh, winter is coming. I assume Bray Wyatt's going to be on that show. I don't know that. Feels like something they would do. Yeah, they, they like their, their poetry, don't they? Of Last year they had Sting debut, and so... This year, they got to have another big debut. And what bigger star than Wyndham Rotunda? Sure. Sure. (sighs) God, I just look, I just maybe he's a nice fellow or maybe he's not. I'm not confident in either uh, uh, assertion, but I don't. I'm sorry. Like the dude hasn't. I haven't enjoyed anything that dude has done since like 2014. So. Him coming to AEW, I, I, I don't, I don't need more lore on this show. All right, I think you're gonna get it. I think you're gonna get more lore. Oh, he's gonna feud with Cody too, isn't he? Uh. 
Yeah, I mean, I think you're gonna get some more. And uh, what's his name? Uh, took out uh, 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 Pax Eye on Rampage this week. Oh, right. Oh, we're continuing the Seth Rollins gimmick from yeah, yeah. Malachi Black uh, took Pax Other Eye out on uh, on Dynamite this, or on Rampage this week. So that, there's that. Or yeah, the. So they have a big show coming up in two weeks, but the stuff on this this past week's Dynamite that I guess is important are uh, Cody set himself on fire. <laughs> he sure did. Did you see the photo? I think there's a photo, new photo today of what his back looked like. Yes. Oh, my goodness. Like, what is wrong with that, dude? <laughs> I don't know. So he started the match and everybody on Twitter's like, before they did a, a fire spot in the Cody Andrade Alito match on AEW Dynamite this week, before they did a fire spot, he comes out and uh, they're doing this street fight. And everybody's like, what is wrong with his back? It looks like he's got a terrible sunburn. Mm-hmm. And then I guess somebody explains, well, it looks like they put like some kind of uh, flame retardant on his back so that, hey, there's going to be a fire spot coming. Uh, which I guess makes sense, or possibly they practiced earlier in the day, <laughs> and he also burnt himself up <laughs> earlier in the day. One of the two, anyway. Either, anyway, so then they do the spot where Cody like tries to superplex through a flaming table, and uh, Andrade avoids the flames. Cody sets himself on fire, uh, and then just pins Andrade, <laughs> even though Cody went through the table. I will say they had a, the first camera angle. Like it looks like Andrade's went face first into it. At least the the subsequent camera angles kind of just looked like on Andrade tumbled over and landed on his butt. But, um, but yeah, Cody is just an absolute madman. I don't like because I understand the idea of we're doing this meta thing of the heel who thinks he's still a baby face or whatever, right? Like. I get it. Like he's in on it now. I'm 90% right. sure um, right. <laughs> that he's right. in on it and that this is, they're doing this on purpose. But I was like, well, what is, but it's like, it's also, it's like, I would also understand it more if this was with, if this was another Malachi black match because they've been feuding for months and months. I was right. like, why is he so mad at, I guess Andrade's beaten him up a couple times, but like, what is, he's so mad at Andrade that he pulled out a fire, that he pulled out fire to deal with Andrade. And then the other side of that is like they did like it's a reverse superflex. Like he has him in like the position for crossroads and then falls backwards and Andrade does the backflip off of it. Basically, it's like Andrade like got a pretty long beard and long hair. And if I were him and my face came that close to that much lighter fluid, I'd be upset. And then Cody covers him and like a piece of the enamel of the table or something is stuck to Cody's shoulder and it's still on fire as he puts his shoulder over yes. Andrade. And you see Andrade immediately starts swatting at Cody's <laughs> shoulder as he's supposed to be laying there unconscious or whatever. And the ref's tapping it out too. And Cody has all this like black stuff on, on his back, which I guess is like pieces of the table that burned onto his skin. So what are like what are like I again like I'm fine if, if we if we just accept all right Cody's doing this weird meta thing and we're we're playing with the audience and we expect him to get booed now all that all right I'm on, I'm all on board with all that but like within the context of this story I don't unless he's just transitioning into like he's a hardcore guy now and he's going to be using like barbed wire and thumbtacks and fire in all of his matches I don't quite. I don't quite understand why this Andrade match needed called for that. And also why you would do it in a way that resulted in like that severe of an injury to you and potential injury to the other guy too. Yeah. It'll make for an interesting episode of uh, season two of roads to the top. That's right. Your, your friend teal market was very upset with the fightful headline today, by the way. I know I saw that Um, my friend teal Margaret. While the criticism, while her criticism did not entirely make sense, and it appeared as though she did not perhaps read the article that she was being critical of, I do applaud the spirit in which it's intended. I, yeah, I, I'm sure it's weird to see people write mean things about your little brother all the time. Sure. 
I, I would imagine. I don't know. <laughs> nobody ever nobody ever talks crap about you, so I don't know. The no. hammer. That's right. <laughs> no one would dare. Yeah, that's right. Uh, and then CM Punk and uh, MJF are doing their they did their sunny days promo this week on on dynamite where mjf said the only thing that cm punk is still the best in the world at is trying to get in Britt baker's pants it's funny because a few days before that i told you if i were aj lee i'd be trying to befriend Britt baker right now just i'm just like don't be surprised if punk shows up with that the wedding ring tattoo on his <laughs> finger that's it. you know like jericho got after he was on dancing with the stars um like i'm just saying don't uh yeah uh, there is a history there and you know wrestling is has not changed as much as maybe we would have liked it to so it's an interesting case study because the first time punk's been married while he's been uh swinging his sword around that's true so we will uh we'll file that one under (laughs) we'll see as we like to say here but yeah it's interesting that they keep I would imagine Punk name dropping her multiple times. He that's like the first name he says in his first promo is Britt Baker's name. And then he's brought her up a couple. Of, now he's she's been brought up a couple more times. I have to assume they want to do Punk and Cole, maybe at the March pay-per-view or something. And that that will be like a little transition uh, in, into that will be that you have him. He keeps name checking Adam Cole's Bay Bay. Okay, if that's what it is, sure. <laughs> I, I don't know that that's the plan, but I would bet <laughs> when they put those guys together, because, you know, by law of averages, they will at some point. This will be brought up. Okay, yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm sure that's what it's all about and not about a legendary swordsman trying to <laughs> trying to add another notch to his belt. Yeah, look, he he and his wife have been together for a long time now. So maybe things have changed or maybe they haven't. Maybe they have or maybe they have. <laughs> All right. Uh, I think we've covered a lot of ground. I have some work to do before I have to watch Impact Wrestling. Oof. No bueno. Anything, anything else you want to talk about? No, I think we uh, we covered the... the... The big things, the, the fat shaming of Tony Storm, the insanity of Cody Rhodes, and uh, and well wishes to Beth Phoenix. The big three. <laughs> All right. Until next time, everybody. I'm Ethan. And I'm Liam. We'll be back soon with more stories from the rest of Bye-bye. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. Now, here are this week's bonus features. And the pops, barley, a delicious alcohol. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yep. Did you read that thing this week about why um, Will Ferrell and Adam McKay aren't going to make any movies together anymore? No. Is it sad? <laughs> well, I mean, they broke up their production company like two years ago. And, uh, I mean, they made Anchorman and Step Brothers and mm-hmm. a lot of the lesser, uh, a lot of the worse uh, Will Ferrell movies also, but also all the good ones. And... Uh, they put out a joint statement like two years ago. It's like, hey, we're going separate ways. Uh, we'll always be friends, but blah, 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 blah. So then they interviewed Adam McKay, who's like doing serious stuff now. Mm-hmm. Um, and he's like, yeah, that was all BS. Uh, he got mad because uh, I'm doing this Lakers, the history of the Los Angeles Lakers show. And I... Um, and Will Ferrell wanted to play Jerry Buss, who owned the Lakers for years. <laughs> and I'm like, this is like a hyper realistic um, thing. And Will doesn't look anything like Jerry Buss. And so I had several conversations 
uh, with people who were around the project and were like, we love Will, but we don't think he's right for it. So I went ahead and cast John C. Riley, who <laughs> is legit, who is legitimately Will Ferrell's best friend uh, as uh, Dr. Jerry Buss in this, in this thing about the Los Angeles Lakers. Mm-hmm. And he's like, I didn't tell Ferrell, but John C. Riley is a stand up guy. And he called Farrell and said, look, I know you wanted this thing, but I got it. And uh, Farrell has uh, not spoken to me since. Wow. <laughs> like we had one very curt phone call. Blah, 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 blah. Uh, I've tried to email him. I never hear back. Uh, but he was legitimately very angry that I would not cast him as the owner of the <laughs> Lakers in this like dramatic mini series about the history of the Los Angeles Lakers. That's fascinating for like a bunch of reasons. One being that like even if Will Farrell did look like him, right? It's Will Farrell. Like it's gonna pull focus if you cast Will Farrell in right. that in a super series. It's kind of, I think that's the reason I never watched that Steve Carell uh collegiate wrestling movie. Uh-huh. I was like it's Steve Carell in a fake nose. It's weird. Like <laughs> I'm sure he, he really acted his heart out, but it <laughs> looks like it's Steve Carell wearing a, a Halloween witch's nose. Yeah. Uh, with dyed hair. Like that's so yeah. that pulled me out of it to it. I think there's just people that get to that level of fame that you can't cast them as like other real. Like, I think I, it's kind of the same thing with like casting them as like a franchise character, like mm-hmm. casting known people as like Superman or something. But it really like for like a real life person, especially in like a drama Mm, no that's you can't yeah can't be gossip. like it's it's sorry man like i mean i don't know like john c Riley, i think just for as goofy as he can be is like has the more like chops as like he has a pretty varied like repertoire of acting roles to his name oh right? yeah he had a, he had a tw- you know 20 some years career as a serious actor before he started doing goofy stuff Right. So like I can see him fitting into that world even even if he is also a recognizable face. But it's like I don't I think if you if yeah, if you spend most of your career doing haha and then you transition, I think it's you know, you can do like artsy, like independent stuff, or you can play a movie where you're playing a person that isn't a real person. But I don't know about casting you and you know. <laughs> But it's also yeah. is fascinating that McKay like didn't tell him like, hey, I think your friend is better for this role than you are. I'm sorry. Like, right. But maybe they would have, you yeah, know, maybe they would have ended up on the outs either way just because it was more about not getting the part or whatever. But either way, that's a, that's a fascinating little development. I was not aware of that. That's, I like a little bit of Hollywood hot goss. Yeah. Yeah, I guess it, I mean the um, the guy who put the, whoever put the interview together uh, was like, I can't believe that he was being this candid about McKay was this candid about it. Yeah, um, I guess you feel a certain amount of bulletproofness at a certain point if you're that guy. He's like, Yeah, all right, well, <laughs> or maybe he thought at the time he did the mutual parting ways thing. It's like, well, you know, that's just what you do, and maybe we'll be friends again in six months or whatever, and right. And we'll figure it out. And then now it's been like, oh, a couple of years. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Time to throw a little gasoline on the bridge. Yeah. I was fascinated that Farrell takes himself that seriously. That is interesting, right? Like there's not, I've never, and then maybe those stories exist and I've just never heard them, but I've never heard like, even on like those blind item sites or whatever of like stuff about him being a, either taking himself seriously as an actor or like being a, being an a-hole or whatever yeah i mean if my supposed best friend and business partner cast my other best friend (laughs) (laughs) in a movie that i wanted to be in and didn't tell me about it like i'd be definitely be pissed for sure so i'm not saying he doesn't have a right to be pissed about it but also it doesn't seem (laughs) it's like what does he have a hundred million dollars in the bank more right (laughs) (laughs) yeah to me he struck me as someone who like would be happy going and living in sweden or wherever his family is from his wife's family is from and never doing another movie again if he didn't have you know if he didn't want to mm-hmm. and no apparently he still he still has the drive to uh 
and wants to do a project about the Los Angeles Lakers. So there you go. All of that is fascinating. <laughs> yeah. I try to keep on keeping on.